Hello, I'm Roger Killen. Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. This evening, Aura McKay is training us creatives on the five things that thriving creative entrepreneurs get right. Aura, welcome. Thank May you. I ask you a couple of get to know you questions? Absolutely. First question is, what makes you so passionate about working with creatives? Well, part of it is coming from a creative background myself with almost 20 years a career as an international award-winning professional photographer. But it comes from the experience that as a creative, I was really well trained in my craft. I was well trained in my skills. I had a lot of support in being successful at my creativity. I did not get supported so much in my business. And I see so many creatives freelancers, solopreneurs, and enterprise level business owners that just haven't been given the training and the skills that they need to truly thrive in today's economy, in any economy. And so over about a decade or so, I decided that I wanted to be cause in the matter of creatives being able to thrive and to bring their ideas, creativity, and innovation to the world. I think we need it on our planet right now. Thank you, Aura. In the course of our uh, earlier conversations, I've noticed that you used a term, and the term is evidence of awesome. Yes. Could you explain what evidence of awesome means? Absolutely. There are so many stories, bad news stories, negativity stories. We are inundated with negativity. And even in our own lives, when we're looking at our businesses, we often look for what's not working, what's wrong, where we're failing, where we come up short. And I think we need to exercise our evidence of awesome muscle, that we have an opportunity to practice looking for what is working, looking for the the awesome that shows up in your life. And I'd like to invite anyone who is watching this live to take advantage of the chat box and to use hashtag awesome if you happen to hear anything tonight that you see as evidence of awesome. And to just start that practice of looking for things that work. Great. The stage is all yours, Aura. Oh, I'm in. Thank you so much. And today's conversation is about five things that successful creatives get right, because most of us start from this place or this dream of being able to have a life and make a living doing work we love. But unfortunately, for many of us, the reality looks a lot more like this, where we keep working really, really hard and we just seem to be just out of reach from that mythical unicorn of success. And it, whether you are a creative entrepreneur or a regular entrepreneur, whether you're a freelancer or a solopreneur, and whether you're at the idea, design, build, or grow stage of your business, my hope and intention is that something in this presentation is going to inspire you to take a different action, is going to be just that little nugget of an idea. I want to take a moment here to explain a little bit about why creatives get challenged so much with business. And it's because we approach business differently from many entrepreneurs. Most entrepreneurs look at the marketplace like a jigsaw puzzle and they look for where there's a gap or a hole in the marketplace. And then they design, build and grow a business to fill that gap. As creatives, we approach business from a completely different direction. We look inside of ourselves at all of our passions, our skills, our ideas, our sparks, and then we design, build, and grow our perfect little puzzle piece and go out in the world and try to find where do we fit and which market will, can we actually serve. Regardless of how you've approached business, you may be coming to tonight or to this presentation feeling overwhelmed, frustrated, burnt out, or lost in your creative business. And this is designed to give you the five things that you can focus on to get you back on track, to reignite that spark, to reconnect you with your creativity, to sort of overcome that whole fear of entrepreneurship that many freelancers experience and give you a step-by-step -step guide to master your creativity. 
the business of your creativity. This is my journey. I call it the journey of the reluctant entrepreneur. Even though I started with a background in financial management and marketing communications, I didn't want to run a business. I wanted to do travel photography and be the next National Geographic photographer. And I went and got trained in my photography skills. And as soon as I graduated, I hit the ground running and I'm gonna go and get paid. And it wasn't until I actually embraced the business as a business, until I started to apply these five things to my own life, that I started to be able to design a life that I absolutely love, where I turned from being a reluctant entrepreneur into a successful entrepreneur. And I started becoming an international award-winning photographer. I led tours all over the world and I started my path as a business instructor, which has led me to being the founder of Business of Creativity and being a business coach and trainer for some incredible entrepreneurs that I have the privilege to be able to work with. To share with you the five things that helped me turn the corner and to create the last two decades of success. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to give you the five things right off the bat, and then I'm going to go into them in detail. So here they are. Treat the business like a business. I know that some of you watching this have been in business for years. You've run multiple businesses, or maybe you have heard this before. I invite you to listen newly or to use it as an opportunity to validate everything you're already doing right when it comes to treating your business like a business. Have a clear vision of success. When I was first starting out, I resisted vision statements and purpose and mission so much. I felt that they were restrictive. I felt that they provided constraint and I wanted to be creative and was multi-passionate. So I'm gonna help you understand how you can have a clear vision of success if you are the same, if you're multi-passionate and creative as well. You need to price for profit and growth. So, um, you know, going in and trying to get market share is great and coming in um, really aggressively in a promotion is great. But ultimately, if you want to be in business for the long term, you have to price for the long term. So we're going to talk about how to do that, not just what to do, but how to do it. Aligned marketing. This makes everything easier in terms of how do you get clients? How do you get more clients? How do you get clients you love? How do you get projects that inspire you? This is the key, having aligned marketing. And then finally, having structure and support for your business. So we're gonna kick it right off at the very beginning, back to basics, things that you guys probably know, but maybe they're just an opportunity for you to tweak or adjust. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly because they are kind of foundational. Separate your personal from business, pay attention to the numbers, pay yourself a salary, follow the rules of the law, and in my opinion, the most important one and the place I'm going to spend some time and I'm even going to give you an opportunity to do a little exercise with is about managing your personal resources. This is how we get out of the overwhelm. This is how we get out of burnout. This is how we reconnect to passion and create boundaries for living our full life. So, the basics, you guys know this already, but if you don't, please make sure that you have separated at least your bank accounts, that you have a separate bank account for your personal stuff and a separate bank account for business. It sounds really basic, but it will start to make all the difference in how you think and approach your business and also in how you do some of the other steps later on. And it is the beginning of separating your self-worth from your net worth your intrinsic value as a human being from the value of the services that you provide and really getting clear on the difference of, between those so that we're not suffering so much from imposter syndrome so that we don't take it so personally when a client doesn't hire us. And finally, separating your income, your personal income from your sales revenue. One of the reasons why we're so exhausted is because we're riding this income roller coaster of a gig economy and our sales are not consistent. But wouldn't it be great if you could actually set it up so that you had a consistent, predictable income, regardless of what the revenue or the sales in your business looked like? We're going to talk about that in today's presentation. But starting to separate 
your personal income from your sales revenue means that you can start to measure more accurately and we can only improve what we measure. So we have to know our numbers. And gang, I come from the, 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 back, the financial accounting background. So I intrinsically love numbers. And secretly, one of my missions in life is to like make everybody in the world love numbers. I want to help, help you guys fall in love with them. So in my trainings, I actually have um, my signature spreadsheet that's got great colors. It's a lot like my presentations. And I try to make it painless and easy because we need to know our numbers when we're in business. Business. This is something you can delegate the, uh, the sort of bookkeeping of, and you can hire great accountants to do it, but you still need to read the information and understand what it means so that you can make powerful decisions about your business. And these are essentially the four things that I think at the basics you need to know. How much does your lifestyle cost? Now, a lot of us, we just pick a random number out of the, the sky and think, oh, I want to make 200,000 a year. I want to make 50,000 a year. But do you actually know what your current lifestyle costs? And do you know what your dream future lifestyle costs so that you can start designing your business to support that dream future lifestyle and so that you actually get there, that you make traction towards your dreams instead of just on that grind and on that treadmill? You need to know what it costs to run your business, what it costs to run your business, even if you have no clients. And there is a cost. There's software costs. There's depreciation costs on your computer and your equipment. There are costs that you have to run your business, even if you have no clients at all. And then there's the additional costs that you have to spend once you have a client. And you need to know ultimately how much you need to sell in order to be able to pay for the lifestyle, pay for your business and pay for any of your subcontractors or cost of goods. These are daunting for some. For those of you that already have this handled, you might be thinking, yeah, so I get it. But for some people, this slide is the thing that stops them completely. And I include numbers in almost every training session that I offer through Business of Creativity because it can be such a challenge for so many. And my job is to make it easy. Once you know your numbers, gang, then you can pay yourself a salary. And there's three steps to paying yourself a salary. The first step is to calculate your desired personal income. We talked about, or I talked about a moment ago, the idea of how much does your lifestyle cost? So getting really clear and pleasant on that, which we're gonna to to talk about in step two and then subtract any income from other sources, other sources that you are earning income from other than this creative business. So this is just calculating what you need this business to pay you. You might earn income from other sources or your spouse might be contributing to that lifestyle. Divide it by 12 months, that's your monthly salary that you need your business to provide you. Then you set up a cash flow solution for your business. Instead of using your personal credit card and your personal line of credit and, and getting your personal stress all the time, run your business like a business and let the business figure out the cash flow to ride those highs and lows of that income roller coaster so that you can have a stress-free, predictable income, plan your vacations, pay your rent, buy your birthday presents and do all of that kind of stuff. And so when your business is transferring a predictable amount to your personally, a lot of that scarcity mindset that can start to kind of take over it starts to ease away as we make that separation and we start treating our business like a business. You gotta follow the rules, gang. Whatever the rules are, even if you're a freelancer. So I know um, that some people are new to freelancing. They're not sure, is it a business? Is it not a business? If you're not sure, go to your local small business center. But I would recommend you to play by the rules. Register your business, collect and pay taxes, have a privacy policy. And the number one rule that you wanna follow is the rule of contracts. Contracts might feel scary, might feel like, oh, I don't really need them. That's not who I am. My vibe is too creative. And I, and then, you know, contracts kind of just, it just doesn't work. Use a contract, especially if you are doing pro bono work, if you are doing barter, if you are doing work for friends and family, especially then use a contract. 
communication is so critical to creating a positive experience with you and your services. And ultimately, that's what we want. We want people to have a positive experience when they hire us and work with us. And a contract makes all of that run way more smoothly. And when it doesn't, it gives you something to go back onto. The last thing that we're going to talk about in treating your business like your business is about managing your personal resources. So I use an acronym for personal resources, and I believe that you have these no matter how big your business is or how small your business is. Each of us has our own personal resources that we bring to the conversation, that we bring and invest into our business. And the first of those resources is time. Some of us have limited time that we can invest in our business because we have commitments to other aspects of our life. Some of us feel like all we do is spend time on our business and we don't have anything else and we have no boundaries. So I encourage you to do this exercise. Most of the time, I'm just gonna show you my face for a minute because sometimes if we get bored of looking at slides, most of the time when we think about slides, gang, we th or we think about time, we think about 24 hours in a day. I'm gonna challenge you to think about 168 hours in a week, 168 hours in a week. So if you sleep eight hours a night, not many of us do these days, but if you sleep eight hours in a night, that's 56 hours. You're gonna give 40 hours to your business. That's 96 hours. What are you gonna do with the rest of that time? And if you start to inventory and audit where you're investing your resources, you start to get present to what is so, then you can make informed decisions about how you want to spend your time and how you want to spend your energy. We know that not every client is created equal. We know that some clients take way more effort and way more energy to work with. We know that some tasks take more effort and energy. So when you're thinking about your business, be mindful and intentional about where you're investing your energy into your business. The third one I'm gonna share with you here is assets. And most of the time when we think about assets, we think about money, but you have so many other assets available to you. And um, this is actually really, fun. I call this my inventory of awesome because, you know, I like the word awesome, but to give yourself a little inventory, to just go and give yourself um, a list and start saying, here are my skills, here are my capabilities, here are my relationships. So when you start thinking about relationships with past clients, you start thinking about relationships with referral partners, affiliate partners, you start thinking about your inner circle, past jobs, past mentors, other colleagues, other people in their same industry. All of these people are assets and they're available to you to be able to help you run a successful creative business. Yes, include your portfolio. Yes, include your money, your equipment and your other tangible assets and start to really get good at looking at what makes you so awesome. These are assets that you can then start to think about how you're going to leverage effectively in your business when you start to create your clear vision. The final one is the one that we're gonna to get to do an exercise on, your mindset. We're going to audit your mindset and your beliefs for a moment because the most powerful tool that you have is your thoughts. When you look at how your thoughts um, impact your actions and start to influence your results, the power of our thoughts is extraordinary. Look at the results that you've got in your life. Look at the money you have in the bank. Look at the clients you've got. Look at your website. Look at your Instagram account. That's a result of actions that you took or actions that you did not take. And you took those actions based on whatever it was you were thinking and feeling. I feel like I'm inadequate with Instagram. I think Instagram is confusing and hard. Therefore, I'm not gonna take consistent action. Therefore, I'm gonna get the results that I get. 
I feel and I think that I can learn something about Instagram. I think that it's possible for me to good with, get good with practice. Therefore, I'm going to practice. Therefore, I get the results. So we can see the power of managing our mindset so that we will actually do the work to get the result that we want, to make a living and have a life doing work with that we love. So grab your pen and paper. This is an all play. This is an opportunity to get your head out of the sand and start to look around at what is possible for you. Many of our current beliefs are based on wherever we're at in our journey. So take your pen and paper and start writing down what you think about the presentation so far. What's come up for you when we've talked about the basics of business and treating your business like a business? Some of these might sound really familiar. I'm too creative to be good at business. Nobody's spending any money these days. It's impossible to be successful at business. So whatever you have written down, the next step in that is to transform these into progressive statements. So by the way, ostriches, once they get their heads out of the sand, they can run really, really fast. But I didn't want to get a fast graphic here because they would be too distracting. So I had to slow-mo my ostrich roll. Here you go. So the first step is write down your beliefs. You've already done that. The second step is to rewrite your belief using words like, I am in the process of, I am making progress with. In the past, up until now, I believed that it was impossible for creatives to make money. I'm in the process of learning how it's possible for creatives to make money. There is a free resource available for you. If you go to my website under resources, it's there, specifically progressive statements. If you want that, that resource is available to you. The key though, is that you practice using the progressive statements. The way that we get good at anything is we need to practice our mastery and master our practice. So the key is that you practice that your default ways of thinking will come up again and again and again. And that's an opportunity to practice your progressive statements and start shifting that mindset so that you can take the actions you want to take and get the results that you want to get. All right. So I don't see any questions in the chat box. I'm going to give you just a moment. Uh, have a look at you all. Does anybody have any questions or we're ready to move on? All right, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to step two, which is have a clear vision of success. So clear vision of success. What does that actually mean? So a clear vision of success means defining your dream lifestyle. Lots of us have given up on our dreams in 2020. I encourage you to get back on the dream wagon and start thinking about what does your dream lifestyle look like going forward. And I encourage you to look like more than 10 years in advance, because often what happens if we look too close, we get all caught up in the how am I going to do it. So look more than 10 years in advance. Then once you have the lifestyle defined, then design your business then write down why that it matters and set milestones. So um, milestones, you gotta, if you're gonna set the milestones, you gotta measure. So pyramid of success. Yes, our ultimate goal is to have this dream lifestyle. That's why we've become an entrepreneur in the first place. We could have gone out and got a nine to five job, but no, we decided entrepreneur, we have a dream, we have a vision for our lifestyle. The more clarity that you can get, the more you can spearhead all of the actions and, and activities that you do for the purpose of living the fullest, most amazing life, the better off you're going to be. And most of us, when we do start to get into business, it's probably like it was for me, where I was just so excited to get paid to be doing any kind of photography that I just said yes to that client. And then the next person who wanted to pay me, I said yes to that person and so on and so on. And then I ended up with this hodgepodge client list, with this weird portfolio and no clear direction for my business. And I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. I felt like it was the grind. So really looking at how do you define your dream business based on why it matters to you. 
This is why, gang, there can be multiple players in the same game. There can be lots of us in the same industry because we're all coming and approaching it from a different place because of a different reason. You hear all over the internet, it's all about your story. It's all about your why. It is. At its core, often the why of your business is what will set you apart and make you unique. And what is separating you right now from having that passion, your story and your why, and actually realizing the business and the dream lifestyle are these five things. So how do you design that dream business? How does that actually work? It's actually fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, once upon a time in the 20th century, way back in the dark ages, we had business planning that was tedious, that took a really long time, that ended up like getting about 200 pages of paper. You would finish the business plan and you'd put it in a drawer and you'd never look at it again. What if you could create a living document meaning that it was updated and that it was flexible and that it was responsive, that could act as a framework, as a guideline, as sort of like the banks of a river to focus your energy and to give you clear direction for taking actions consistently. That's really what you need at its core is a framework that answers who are you, why does this business matter, who are you serving in this business, how exactly do you serve them? And why do they care about that and wanna hire you? Finally, what are the goals of your business? And when you work on the goals of your business, we're not looking 10 to 15 years out into the future. We're looking much closer. We're looking at the next sort of one to three years in your business so that you can set meaningful goals that you can start to break down into actions. How do you set goals? Well. There's a couple of different ways you can set goals. You can set goals with numbers. Lots of people have heard of SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, reasonable, and timely, I think those are. Somebody else put it in the chat if I got them wrong. Um, you can set goals based on fulfillment. You can set goals based on impact and the difference that you make to others through your work or through the services that you provide to specific clients. So when you're setting goals. It doesn't always have to be on income or profit or return on investment. It can also be on meaning, creativity, self-expression, and values. It can be about choosing to work with the kinds of clients who are doing the thing in the world that you want to be a part of, that you want to support with your creative services. So you can set goals for the kinds of clients that you want to work with. You can set goals for the kinds of projects that are going to add that spark and reconnect you to that creative self-expression, as well as looking at sales, income, profit, growth, followers, et cetera. So any questions about treat the business as a business? Thank you, Lynn. All right. How about any questions about have a clear vision of success? Excellent. So let's get to pricing for profit. This is a place where so many creatives get stuck or stumbling that they, we have no idea how to price. And a lot of it is because we get so many different messages about how to price and what we should charge and how to calculate it and what we have to pay attention to. And it can be incredibly overwhelming and it can be like just going to put your head in the sand and not deal with it. So here's what I think is important to think about when you are pricing for profit and growth. It's not the only things to think about, but I'm trying to simplify things by eliminating the stuff that doesn't really impact successful businesses as much, or it's not as general. So these are the things that I think. First of all, design your offers with intention. Know your numbers, that's way back in the beginning of the slide. Know your numbers, you can't get away from it. Price for the project, not by the hour. Be strategic. So what are you actually charging for? When you design your offers with intention, you do think about what you include, 
but you also think about why you include it. So when you think about your offer, how you're saying, okay, I'm gonna do web design services, I'm gonna do headshots, I'm gonna do graphic design, I'm gonna do whatever it is you're gonna do, monthly accounting packages, whatever it is, there are certain things that you're gonna include. You're gonna include your services, you're gonna have specific deliverables, and you're gonna have your own process, whether it's the process for creating it, the process for onboarding, the process for serving or operating or however it is. You're gonna, that is essentially what they're buying, but it isn't why they're buying. And if all you focus on when you're thinking about price, when you're thinking about your business is what do I sell? What do I sell? What do I sell? You're missing the key ingredient that has people buy from you and has you be able to feel more confident in your value when you price it. And that piece is about why do you include it? What is the external or obvious need that your services solve? But what is the internal need and the philosophical need of your client? So when we think about pricing, when I have people design their offers in the pricing for creatives class, I'm gonna explain that a bit later. When I have people design their pricing and design their offers, we actually go through and we match each element of the offer to the client need by using a buy your offer so that because. So my ideal client hires me so that, not so that they can get 10 headshots, it's so that they have 10 different images to choose from when they're establishing their personal brand on Instagram because they want variety and they wanna be seen as this great prestigious person and all of this extra stuff. So, you know, Domino's doesn't sell pizza. They sell convenience. So really thinking about you're not selling what you think you're selling. So you're not pricing for what you think you're pricing for. And starting to think instead, what am I actually delivering them? And what is that worth? So when we start looking at that, there are a couple of different pricing models that I recommend. The one I do not necessarily recommend that you use to price to your clients, but it is still important to know, not how I would price to my clients, but I still wanna know this number, is I wanna understand how, how much per hour. But here's the deal. If I charge by the hour, my client pays more the longer it takes. Instead of paying more for a rush job, if I decide to take 15 hours doing it, they have to pay more money than if I only took 10. The client will often try to squeeze extra things into that hour, or they hire you for four days or a half day and they try to squeeze all these, and then scope creep gets so big that it bursts the bubble and you can't get everything done. And then you have disappointed clients, which is not what our intention is with our business. Often, if you charge by the hour, you have to do a lot of justification and explaining of why it takes so long and why this takes an hour and why this takes half an hour. And you can get away from the difference that you make and the value you provide. And you might earn less money the faster you get. So if last year you could do a web design in 10 hours and this year you can do a web design in eight hours, that means this year you'd make less money for the same job because you're better at it? That doesn't make any sense at all. Instead, if you charge by the project, the client pays the same amount of money for the project, regardless of how long it takes you. I mean, they have their deadline, but they don't care if it took you 10 hours to meet that deadline or 15 hours to meet that deadline. The value of the project to the client is the same. And the client stays focused on the value. And it's a lot easier to say, no, this was the boundary and scope of the project for this amount. If you want me to add extra stuff, that's a, that's a scope creep because you become very clear on what the project is in order to be able to price effectively. You don't usually have to justify your time because the client doesn't know how much time it takes you. It's none of their business. And so often you can start earning more money without raising your prices, without selling more stuff, just by becoming more efficient at your creative skill, which is awesome. 
All right, here are some pricing strategies. So these, so pricing models are how do you design your pricing? Pricing strategies are how do you leverage your pricing in the marketplace? And so these are some pricing strategies to consider that many of us haven't even considered that our price impacts our marketing, that our price should be set with an intention for a goal or an outcome. And these, these are just sort of five different kinds of pricing strategies that I go through in our pr Pricing for Creatives Masterclass, but I wanted to give them to you right now just to consider as part of the conversation that not all prices are just based on time plus cost plus some kind of mysterious intellectual property or usage fee. That there is a way to calculate it. All right, I do see that there is a question here. So the question is, let me just get my little thing here. So the question is charging for the project can also be challenging if the clients take too long to give feedback or require multiple changes and don't want to respect the contract. Okay, so first of all, I think the biggest challenge in this is that the client doesn't respect the contract. Whatever contract you've made, if you have a client who's abusing a contract or who's not uh, respectful of the contract, it's likely they would do that if you charged by the hour or if you charged by the project. So that might be in being um, having more clarity in your communication, having more clarity in your um, client onboarding so that the boundaries and the communication and the production timeline and the expectations are super clear in advance. Often we assume that our clients understand our craft and they don't necessarily know how long it takes to do a revision to three different brand logos. They, they don't necessarily understand how long it takes to pick colors and pick fonts. So our job often is educating our clients. We're selling something that is invisible. We want to remember that when we're selling creative services, we're selling a promise for something that is invisible. And when you sell something that is invisible, it's you're you're asking for a lot of trust. You're asking for a tremendous amount of trust from your clients. So depending on how good of a job you've done in terms of aligning your marketing, which is the next section, if you've done a great job of aligning your marketing, by the time they get to buying from you, they already kind of know what the boundaries are and how it's going to work. So then you can just nudge them into, hey, listen, um, that's, that's three changes outside of the scope of contract. Do we need to renegotiate the project? Has the project changed and evolved? And you know what, gang? Be open to change and evolution. A lot of times that can generate even more opportunities for you. So if you go to the conversation with the intention of I'm here to solve a problem and to be of service to my client, then it's not about them challenging what's in your project or not. it's just really genuinely how can how can I be of service to this person? How would that actually look? So hopefully that answered your question, Stephanie. Great. Um, yeah, excellent. So we're going to get back to the content. Excellent. Next is aligning your marketing. So I've talked about alignment a lot because alignment is something that's really important to me. I just see that there's a couple more chats. So I'm just gonna check here before we go through. Yeah, I'm gonna go back, and get those questions for you. All right, so pricing, about pricing. How can we be flexible and fair to our clients at the same time? Saying no is easier than yes. Money is so important, but making connections are important too, especially for startups. Can you mention a strategy to follow when we discuss budgeting and money for clients, especially clients with low budget? Okay, I do have a, I do have a suggestion. So here's my suggestion, and I would approach it using value-based pricing questions. So if you need to Google, Google value-based pricing questions, look for the future with no E, and also look for Blair Ains, 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 I don't know how to say his last name. So um, pricing, 
Value-based pricing goes like this. Hey, client, you have a project? Client says, yeah, I have a project. And they tell you about the project and you say, oh, awesome project. What kind of a difference do you think that project is gonna make for your business? And then they tell you about the difference that the project is gonna make for their business and how that's gonna make their life so awesome. And you say, oh, that is amazing. What do you think that kind of a, an impact and change is worth? Like, what is the value of that change to your business? And they say, wow, you know, I think that could probably increase my business by about $10,000. Or if they say, you know what, without your help, I don't think that I could even have a business. And you say, okay, what would it be worth to you to get that result? And then they give you a number. And often that number is way higher than if you just asked what the budget was. And so once they tell you the budget, you can either stick with that budget and say, okay, for that budget, I can do this, but I can't do that thing that you asked me. Or for that, you can say, I'm sorry for that budget. I can't get you those results that you want. I'm gonna have to refer you out. Um, I think um, it's this. I think it's E-N-N-S is Blair's last name. He, um, he wrote a book called Win Without Pitching is the name of his book. Win Without Pitching, it's a, a manifesto. All right, and then what about putting together project proposals that detail the stages of the project idea, um, I, deadlines for each phase and payment dates at the beginning of each said phase? Yeah, awesome. So your revenue collection strategy is also part of your pricing. So whether you collect a payment upfront, which I would recommend if you're having trouble collecting payment in full from your clients, what I would suggest to you is that you get a retainer. A retainer is different than a deposit. You'll have to check the legal lease with wherever you are in the world, but often a retainer is not refundable. A deposit is refundable. Um, so you would want to get some payment in advance. And then, yeah, absolutely. So many businesses right now have money, but they're cash flow sensitive. So they don't want to spend big chunks all at once. So maybe your offer is brilliant. Your price is perfectly great for your business model and strategy. And the only thing you need to adjust is that instead of getting it all payment all at once, you may just adjust your revenue collection strategy and have it be collected at certain phases. And what I would suggest is that you have really specific outcomes and measurable um, uh, goals for each phase so that it's really clear that you've reached the end of that space. Awesome. Okay, so I think we got that. We'll go now into how to align your marketing. So aligning your marketing is about aligning with your ideal client. And at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about the difference between a creative entrepreneur and a regular entrepreneur. And most regular entrepreneurs are already looking out in the marketplace at their ideal client, at their target market, at the needs and wants of their market. Most creatives, we look inward and we forget that actually our business is more about them than it is about us. Yeah. Business is more about them than it is about us. So we want to align our marketing with our ideal client, including all of the pieces of our marketing. Our offers are part of our marketing strategy. When you have offers that are aligned with that desired outcome, when you know people buy from me so that because, it becomes way easier to market to them. Your price is part of aligning, your brand voice, the tactics that you use. Do you use Instagram? Do you use LinkedIn? Um, are you using email marketing? Do you use paid ads? Then you wanna look at marketing message and that our marketing message changes depending on where our clients are in their relationship with us. So let's look, aligned marketing. When your marketing is not aligned, all we can see are the pieces that don't work. When you're trying to communicate to your clients and you've been really consistent with your marketing, but then you have a couple of way out and left field 
marketing messages or things that you've said or things that just don't resonate, it can bring the whole stack tumbling down. So in all of your marketing, you want to know exactly who you're marketing to. We talk about ideal client and avatar client and client persona. 100% business is not about you. It's about them. So the more you know about who you're marketing and selling to, the easier it's going to be. And then you, when you know who they are, you can offer them exactly what they want. And then you can give it to them at a price that matches their value perception, what they think it's worth. And then you can talk to them about it using a tone of voice that they resonate with. My tone of voice is super energetic and enthusiastic and direct. Not everybody responds to this. So this is my tone of voice. My ideal clients will respond to the bright colors and my um, enthusiasm. Additionally, your voice needs to be authentic to your business. People can tell when you're using marketing speak or when you're trying too hard to be something that you are not. And finally, you want to use words and language that are compelling to them. So this is the kind of things that I teach in the Marketing Confidence Program as we start going to the next part, which is whenever you're marketing, you want to have a clear next step for them to take. So every single marketing message has a clear next step. This is what to do next with me. We often call those um, calls to action. This spreadsheet is the spreadsheet that I use to help my clients understand their brand voice and to align it with the brand experience, where you would pick your five brand characteristics. So a lot of you have already done branding, you've done a brand identity, you have your visual identity package, you know exactly who you are as a brand, you've got your colors and your fonts and all of that great stuff, awesome. And probably in the um, development of that, you had to do an exercise that um, had you decide or determine what are the sort of five word characteristics that I want my brand to be known for. And then write those down. Then in the next column, you write a description of how that applies to you because human beings, we use words in very weird ways. So there's going to be words that have significance and meaning to you. Write those down. And then here's the great part because these two columns, this is what my brand will do, and this is what my brand won't do. This is where your posts for social media come from. This is where your posts for your emails come from. This is where your tone of voice in your proposals, this is how you set up your operations is based on the brand voice, brand experience that you wanna create. I do have an example for you. This is my brand voice so that you can see this filled out. You can see how it is, it is, is um, comprehensive. So one of my characteristics is I have a supportive brand. I don't want to just love you and leave you. I don't want to just give you information and then walk away. Information is potential power, but action is where results happen. So I want to support you. I want to be there beyond. I want to answer question quickly. I want to celebrate others. I want to be a cheerleader. I'm going to encourage community and I'm going to be there for you. I am not going to be dismissive, put people down, embarrass them or use negativity as a tool to motivate because it's not part of my brand voice. So I can look right here and say, I don't want to use jargon. So I have to think really hard. How can I take business language and make it more accessible for creative thinkers? Because I don't want to use jargon. I don't want to do traditional stuff. And I don't want to recycle other people's content because I want to be a creative, energetic, unique expert. So do this exercise for your own brand and see what can come from it in terms of discovering that this may be the key to unlocking what do I post on LinkedIn. All right, the last piece here as we're starting to look at how do we align our message for each stage of the buyer's journey given that at each stage of the buyer's journey, the client is having a different experience. So many of you have seen a buyer's journey before, but at the top of this slide, these are the activities or the intentions that you as the business person are gonna hold, that you wanna attract new prospects. You wanna engage 
with your leads. You want to convert into your hot leads. You want to close them into customers. So that's your intention for each stage of the buyer's journey. And there are different tactics that you use. So things like a social media platform is a tactic. Email is a tactic. Lead magnets are a tactic. Referrals are a tactic that you can use to grow your business. And let me tell you, if you are getting referrals already out there in the world, gang, you're doing awesome. And at each of those stages, you have down here on the bottom, your client who starts out as a prospect, but then you want them to do something, to have a specific next step to take. So if you are doing attraction marketing, the next step is follow me, join my list. And then all of a sudden, once the client or prospect takes that action, they become a follower. And then so on and so on, as they move through that buyer's journey, getting closer and closer to becoming a client. And your message at each stage would change and evolve in order to be able to move them in an effective way so that by the time they go to, you go to sell to them, they're so ready, you've already qualified, you already know that they're the best one. So you're not having to send out five proposals and get one back. So you're not having to do 27 discovery calls and only booking two. So that by the time you get to a sales conversation, you're having an incredibly powerful sales conversation. So gang, that's Align Your Marketing. We have one more section left. I don't see any questions in the chat box. Oh, I do. I'm reading, uh, Ryan, I'm reading your um, question. Definitely, if you break your, um, your contracts into different phases, you have a lot less of a big thing to fight for or fight about if something does go wrong, for sure. Does it mean you should do both discovery calls and sales calls? Some business models need that. Um, some, um, for my business model specifically, I absolutely do a discovery call. Um, everyone who is watching this video and watching it live is getting an opportunity to have a call with me. And that is not a sales call. That is genuinely a discovery call. What are you up against? What do you need to do? And then I have a separate sales conversation because I like to keep the integrity. I don't know if you saw my, my brand voice, part of it is integrity. So I like to keep the integrity between them so that people don't feel pressured when they come to a discovery call. And I have way more of an opportunity to help people. And there are people that I say no to that I don't want to work with or that maybe I'm not the right fit for where they are in their journey. So I will decline them as a client and I'll refer them out. And that's why I have a great group of assets as other coaches, other photographers, other creatives that I can leverage and, um, and send that out. Is there a book or text or e-letter for this? I'm not sure for this presentation, William. For this presentation, William, I'm not sure. Maybe you just want to unmute yourself for a moment. I know that um, Roger is going to be um, saving this as a video for you. And if you do want my slides from this, I'm happy to send you my slide deck. Um, just go ahead. And if you are do want my slide deck, put your email in the chat box to me privately so that I know All that right. it's for me. All right. Um, yeah, I meant with regards to this presentation, is there, I missed probably two thirds. Of it, so. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Well, your best thing is to go to the Vancouver Business Network on YouTube okay. and check it out because there's in addition to this content, there's some really great other content there. But if you do want these slides, I'm happy to send them. Um, like I said, just send me a private message in the chat so that I can save my private messages and I can make sure to send that out to you later on. Sound good? It, yeah, awesome. it's, it's actually the bullet points I was interested in, like rather than the pictures yeah okay well the bullet points will be in the whole slide deck as well hopefully that'll be helpful for you i hope that answered your question yeah okay so any other questions on aligned marketing i think we're good i'm seeing some emails excellent 
Fabulous. So gang, I know that a lot of this is going super quickly. We are at the last point. And the last point is to establish structure and support. So if this has gone whizzing by, do take advantage of Roger, Roger's generosity and watch it again. Um, again, YouTube, the Vancouver Business Network, and he will be sure to send out the email to everyone. Um, but this one in particularly, we often just dismiss. So even though it's at the end of the presentation, it's still valuable and important. And as freelancers, solopreneurs, and most creatives, we tend to try to go it alone. And hence, we wear all the hats, and we feel all the pressure, and we feel all the doom and gloom, and it's hard to get any outside perspective on what is actually happening. So the first thing you want to do is you do want to establish a structure so that you can be working on your business, not just in your business, so that you make time to reconnect to your passion, you make time to reconnect to your dreams, you make time to work consistently in and on your business, and then have a system in place to review, revise, and recommit to your goals. So you want to have a system in place. And you know, I know we resist structure and system, but I'm here to tell you that when we have structure, we actually create room inside, we can be wildly creative. So what's great about the business of creativity is we give you those structures inside which you get to create your own business, your own dreams, your own offers, your own prices. So you wanna surround yourself with a network of support so that you don't feel so alone, that you don't feel like you're just doing it all uh, by yourself. So structure, the benefits are when you have structure, you're able to be consistent, you can make decision-making faster, you can have room for innovation, and you can repeat your success. When you have support, you can actually go after bigger possibilities in the world because you are lifted up with the support of others. You can see bigger possibilities because of an outside perspective. I love my coach. I love the mastermind groups that I'm in because I get to see things about my business that I can't see by myself. You get faster results when you're supported and you have a sense of well-being and belonging that's missing for many. Gang, when you have those elements, you cannot help but have your business thrive and have it rise up in terms of its success. And so that you can stop being the passionate, hardworking, creative entrepreneur chasing the mythical unicorn of success. And you can instead be living the dream of having, um, making a living and having a life doing work that you love. If this has been powerful for you, valuable for you, I encourage you to connect with me and let me know what resonated, but even more so, if something about this presentation came up for you that you thought, you know what? I need more on that piece. I need to understand more about my pricing. Maybe there's something I could tweak there. Maybe there's a piece about that marketing that I could do and I could understand better. I encourage you to reach out to me. It's not like cleaning your house where you have to like vacuum before the maid gets there or hiring a trainer where you gotta lose 30 pounds before you can go to the gym. There's nothing to do, there's nothing to prepare. All you need to do is to click that link www.businessofcreativity.ca slash clarity call and book a time to get clear on your best next steps for your business. I can help you set up those clear goals, get focused on what actually matters, which of those five things you even need to pay attention to right now or first, and help you create a business breakthrough. And like I said earlier, this is a discovery call. This is not a sales call. It's there for you to discover how you can use those five things in your business right away. Thank you so much. Aura, that was one of the best presentations I have uh, ever heard to entrepreneurs in general and specifically to creatives. Thank you so much. My guess is 20-ish 20, 20 percent of the world are creatives mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and they get the, edu the, the monikers starving artist and so on. <laughs> And you've just presented them with a step-by-step -step guide as to how this doesn't have to be. 
doesn't have to be that way. I am committed to bridging the gap between creativity and commerce. It is possible. You certainly have demonstrated that. Uh, on behalf of Vancouver Business Network, our guests, and those who are going to view your video, I just thank you so, so much for sharing this wisdom in a, in a way that people can actually hear it and take action around it. Mm. Thank you so much for that feedback. I'm going to uh, conclude the recording, but people on live, online, in real time, don't go away. There's more for you. <laughs>